When it comes to relationships, a genuine connection is everything. Only when we're with people who get us, like really get us, can we be our true selves. So find a better connection with eHarmony, the dating app that helps you be more true to yourself. eHarmony gets to know you better so they can match you better with people who will really get you. Make a genuine connection. Take eHarmony's compatibility quiz today and get someone who gets you. In three, two, one. Seven things you don't really need to know, but probably should. I'm Jamie East, and this, this is the Sunday Sun. On today's episode, we're tapping into plant communication. There's evidence that other people's sweat could help treat social anxiety, and we celebrate 50 years of the mobile phone. But first, it was on this day in 1981, Nature published the longest scientific name in history, with 16,569 nucleotides. The systematic name for human mitochondrial DNA is 207,000 letters long, aka a Scrabble Annihilator. It can be hard to remember a time before we had mobile phones, can't it? Now they've replaced maps, watches, calendars, cameras and so many more devices and tools. Well, this week marks 50 years since the first ever mobile call. We started out with the Bricklight Motorola's DynaTAC 8000X and mobile technology has certainly come a long way since. To celebrate, here are some of the top moments from the last 50 years that made smartphones what they are today. First up, that very first call. On the 3rd of April 1973, on a busy street in New York, the world's first mobile phone call was made. Martin Cooper, an engineer at Motorola, rang his friend at rival firm Bell Laboratories to tell him what he was doing. Uh, I took out my phone book. That gives you an idea what primitive times these were. Uh, and I called my counterpart in the Bell system, a fellow named uh, Joel Engel. I dialed his number uh, and amazingly he answered. And I said, uh, Joel, I'm calling you uh, a cell phone, but a real cell phone, a personal, handheld, portable cell phone. Up next, a ringtone that's engraved on everyone's brain. Ding, ding. No, God, not that one. In 1994, Wet 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 had the best-selling single, but it's this iconic Nokia ringtone that defined the year and still has us reaching for our pockets. And finally, hey Siri, can you set a reminder to subscribe to the Smart 7 podcast? Okay, I've added subscribe to the Smart 7 podcast to the list. There you go, why don't you try the same? Uh, after the huge success of the iPod, Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone in January 2007, and by June of the same year, people had it in their hands. 30 years after the first mobile, the iPhone, with its multi-touch display covering most of the device, earned its place as Time Magazine's invention of the year, changing the tech industry forever. Your houseplants might be crying out for help, if only you could hear them. Researchers at Tel Aviv University in Israel have found that plants make sounds that are undetectable to the human ear, and they get noisier if they need water or if their stems have been cut. The audio of the sounds made by a dry tomato plant have been sped up and edited so it can be heard. Have a listen to this. Here's Professor Lilac Haddeny, the study's lead author. When a tomato plant is feeling well, it emits very few sounds. But when it is stressed, when it is dehydrated or cut or sick, it emits plenty of sounds. And we can uh, tell the type of stress and the species of the plant from this sound. These results have several implications. First, it means that in many cases, plants that appear stressed are also emitting sounds only we do not hear them. According to Yossi Yeovil, a co-author of the study, this could mean that someone or something is listening to these sounds. Many mammals, small mammals, rodents, bats, I study bats most of the time, can hear these plants. Many insects can hear ultrasonic signals in these uh, frequencies and we analyze and we show that they can uh, do so from several meters. And that's exactly what we're studying now. So for example, you can imagine a moth uh, eavesdropping on the plant 
when it is making a decision such as uh, where to eat or what plant to eat or something like that. That's exactly the, the directions that we're interested in right now. And so now we know plants make noise, what are we supposed to do with this knowledge? One immediate possibility is, of course, agriculture, right? We could perhaps uh, eavesdrop on the plants from a distance and say whether they're drying out, whether they, they're de- dehydrated. Maybe we can manipulate insects if some of them are uh, listening to the plants. But these are all still just ideas uh, that have to be uh, followed up on. Still to come on the Sunday 7, sweat for social anxiety and an Argentine giant arrives in London. How do you manage your anxieties? Well, according to new research, there could be a new treatment on the horizon. A new study from the Karolinska Institute in Sweden shows that sniffing other people's sweat may be able to help treat social anxiety. What the? We spoke to the study's lead researcher, Elisa Wigner, and apparently it's not just about body odour, but it's all about the chemo signals. Are you sure? So, uh, chemo signals are molecules that are produced by our body as an answer to specific uh, physical and emotional states. And uh, these uh, molecules are able to produce uh, behavioral and physiological responses in other um, humans. So how did you gather these sweat samples and what did you do with them? Basically, we invited women aged from 18 to 35 to come to the lab and uh, do a mindfulness uh, meditation through an app while they were uh, sniffing from a little tube placed under their nose. They were receiving this airflow coming from a specific machine which contained uh, sweat pads. So the sweat pads were previously collected in another study done in Lisbon. And these sweat pads contained uh, the sweat of uh, people that were watching either happy or fearful movies or Uh, the third group of women was exposed to uh, clean air. So the airflow didn't have actually anything in there. What they found was that patients who completed a mindfulness session while exposed to body odours saw a 39% reduction in social anxiety, while without body odour, there was a 17% reduction in those anxiety scores. It is a, a big difference, but you have to consider that this is a relative measure. So uh, the score saying that it's 40% less, it might mean that between uh, there is a like four point uh, difference in the score or two points, then you actually need to get into the uh, into the real number to understand the magnitude of, of the change. Elisa, were you at all surprised by those results? We were surprised because we saw that uh, the group, the two group exposed uh, to body odor were showing uh, similar results and they were exposed, one, to fearful uh, body odor, so uh, sweat that was collected from people watching fearful movies, and uh, the other one was sweat collected from people that were watching happy uh, movies. And we were not expecting the same results in these two groups, because we thought that the emotional component of the body odor would have an effect. What are the potential real-life implications of the study then? How can this realistically be used to enhance therapy sessions? For now, there are no real um, implications. I mean, the implications are all hypothetical uh, because this is a a preliminary study, an explorative study. Um, So first of all, we need to replicate and see whether these effects are seen uh, also by other. This is a, a first time study that, that does this kind of uh, experiment. So uh, more research is needed, first of all. And second of all, uh, we used sample that were collected from uh, other people. So in order for it to become something that can be used as a, an answer of existing therapies, the next step of the research uh, is the identification and uh, synthesis of the chemicals responsible for this effect. So until we are able to identify and synthesize these these chemicals, um, I don't see a way of of implementing this type of uh, treatment and answer 
for the public. Okay, so what are the next steps apart from throwing away deodorant? So first of all, we are conducting a bigger study right now uh, with the very similar designs, but we are also including um, another odor group. So a neutral body odor um, to see whether it's the social component as I was uh, talking about. And, uh, and then, of course, in the project, there are other uh, parts that have been uh, carried out by our partners in Visa. And one of them is, uh, as I was saying before, the chemical analysis and uh, the creation of synthetic sweat. And uh, if uh, we are successful with that, then we will proceed in testing also this synthetic sweat in a further study. A replica of the biggest known dinosaur ever to roam the Earth is going on display for the first time in Europe. The colossal Patagotitan Maorum is one of the largest known creatures to have ever roamed the planet, and now it's squeezing into London's Natural History Museum. The Titanosaur, which has been extinct for millions of years, has travelled from Argentina to the UK, where paleontologists hope it'll inspire a new generation. This is Sinead Marin, the museum's exhibition lead. In order to sustain a body of that size, they needed to eat a huge amount of food. So they would have been eating almost all day, every day. And they probably needed about 120 kilos of food just, yeah, per day just to sustain their size. So they would have spent most of the time grazing. It was an Argentinian farmer who spotted the first bone in Patagonia in 2010. He called in scientists and over the next two years they uncovered 280 more. The skeleton that's going on display is actually bones from six individuals cast in resin and pieced together like an intricate puzzle. To get a sense of its size, the titanosaur skeleton is 35 metres long, the equivalent of four double-decker buses and three times the size of a T-Rex. It would have dwarfed elephants and humans alike and paleontologists are still learning about how they were able to evolve to become so large. This is paleontologist Paul Barrett. Really fast growth meant they could get to these enormous sizes and then various aspects of their skeleton meant they could walk around at these large sizes. Huge pillar-like legs, really wide hips that helped stabilise the body and also they would have had a gigantic heart and a huge gut to help power all of the energy that you need to move that body around. As well as inspiring wonder, this exhibit it hopes to also remind people that we have our own titans to protect, like the African savanna elephant, which is currently endangered. By preserving their habitats and preventing their illegal poaching, we can stop them from becoming future exhibits themselves. Still to come on the Sunday 7, a new record for the deepest fish ever recorded and an unusual pint is on the way, right after this. When it comes to relationships, a genuine connection is everything. Only when we're with people who get us, like really get us, can we be our true selves. So find a better connection with eHarmony, the dating app that helps you be more true to yourself. eHarmony gets to know you better so they can match you better with people who will really get you. Make a genuine connection. Take eHarmony's compatibility quiz today and get someone who gets you. You're listening to the Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso, or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. We've had some really clear nights recently, which used to mean a fantastic view of the stars. In recent years, however, the number we can see by the naked eye has decreased dramatically due to light pollution. New research suggests that in areas where 250 stars were once visible 20 years ago, you'd only see 150 now. Whether it's street lighting, advertising or purely decorative, light pollution's getting worse. To find that out, researchers collected night sky observations from all over the world. People went out into their local areas, counted the stars and submitted their results to an online project called Glow at Night. This showed that over the last decade, the night sky has been getting around 10% brighter every year. This is Dr Christopher Kyber from the German Research Centre for Geosciences talking to the BBC about those results. This view of the stars is, is disappearing, right? So this is something that until 
relatively recently, right, within one or two lifetimes, was something that was a shared uh, experience across everyone around the world, this going out and seeing stars at nighttime. It's also a symbol and a reminder that the way we are lighting is relatively wasteful um, and that we don't seem to be getting better at it. The brighter the night sky is, the brighter a star has to be for us to see it with the naked eye. So even in quiet rural areas and on a clear night when the street lights start to glow, the sky glows and that obscures the faintest stars. But light pollution doesn't just obscure the night sky, it's been shown to affect the behaviour of nocturnal animals and to disrupt our sleep and affect our health. And unlike so many complicated environmental problems, this one can be fixed by simply turning down the lights. A new record's been set for the deepest fish ever recorded. And according to scientists, this species isn't even meant to be a deep sea fish. Snailfish are great. Snailfish are amazing because they are not a deep sea fish. So they're the deepest fish in the world, but they're not a deep sea fish. They're a, the family is called Leparidae, and they are 300 species at least of, of snailfish. Most of them are very, very shallow. That's Professor Alan Jameson. He's the chief scientist on the deep sea expedition that caught this fish in August 2022. Most snailfish live in shallow water, but when researchers from the University of Western Australia and the Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology found the fish, it was 27,349 feet down. So I love the fact that they're kind of small and goofy and barren and just not being very deep sea like yet at the same time they're way more deep sea than most deep sea fish. For 10 years this team has been studying the deepest fish in the world and Professor Jameson doesn't believe their new record will be beaten and if it is it won't be by much. It's become trivial now I don't think there's any way in which we'd find a fish a thousand meters deeper or even 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 maybe a hundred meters deeper so we're confident now that we've really really understood this. Full of beer. That sounds unusual, but it could just be the future of your favourite pint. A brewery in eastern Germany has developed a beer powder designed to reduce the heavy carbon footprints of beer exports. To activate the drink, simply mix it with water and voila, le beer. This is Stefan Friedshire, general manager of the brewery, explaining on 7 News Australia how it came about. Yes, yeah, so the point is we are exporting already worldwide uh, through different nations and uh, in different countries. And so we were always unhappy with the fact that uh, we are just um, transporting water and uh, glasses uh, through the world, so bottles and water. So if you think about uh, one, bo uh, one bottle of beer is about a half a kilogram, a kilogram water, half a kilogram uh, of uh, glass. And uh, so how can we do it even better? So we want to reduce uh, the transport uh, mainly so about 90%, so we can just transport uh, the beer. According to the brewery, the powdered beverage tastes well, just like a normal regular beer, although it's alcohol free, but there are plans in the works to change that. Very soon we have also an alcohol version. Uh, we want to about, and in about three months, we are ready with everything. So we have a kind of proof of concept that everything is working very, very well. And then we are looking for, for partners, for investors who wants to find, a, to found a startup with us. And that's not all the brewery has planned. We did a cherry beer, anti-aging beer, bath beer, so you can even take a bath inside the beer, a potato beer, spargo beer. Yeah. Um, so we have about 42 different types of beers which are produced, even marathon beer, uh, 40 different types of beers which are producing right now, and even gluten-free beer, um, uh, non-alcohol, 0.0 um, uh, alcohol-free beer. As a small company, I'm, 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 I'm thinking every day in the morning, I'm thinking about what, what can I do? How can I destroy my own company? Because if I can <laughs> think about the possibility to destroy my own company, yeah. someone else may also do. And so we are developing very, very nice things here. This has been the Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favor and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m. with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend. Produced and published by Daft Doris.